When you think of fancy food, you probably conjure up some image of a Michelin star experience where you can't even identify half the things on your plate. Or if you're anything like me, you might think of a fancy cut of meat like beef tenderloin. Sure, this is a good start, but we're going to turn this most tenderest cuts of beef into its possibly most recognizable form, Beef Wellington. Perfect. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode here at Time Out Kitchen, where today we're going to try our hand at the iconic Beef Wellington. Now, this dish has everything a growing boy needs, from meat, pastry, veggies, and of course, some bourbon, because, you know, put some hair on that chest. Now, if you're like me and you have never made this dish before, then consider this video a sign to give it a shot. But uh, don't worry, I made a number of mistakes along the way, and I will point them out to you so that you can hopefully get a chance to see what they look like and, of course, avoid them. Oh, and speaking of avoiding things, do not avoid watching until the end of this video, because at the end I'll cover some of the tips and maybe some tricks, as well as the pricing and how long this will actually take to put together. Anyways, with all that said, let's get to the ingredients. Now, to make this dish, you will, of course, need the Rolls Royce of beef cuts, beef tenderloin. And specifically, you will want the center cut as it is the most symmetrical part of the tenderloin and will therefore cook the most evenly. Next, you want to grab yourself some puff pastry, which as you can see here, uh, yeah, I bought it. I'm not going to make puff pastry for this one because I don't have that kind of time, but any sheet of puff pastry will do. Next, you want to grab some Parma ham because, of course, we don't have enough meat. Now, here I've got about 12 slices or so. You just need enough to actually wrap your tenderloin. In. So depending on the size, you'll need maybe a bit more or even a bit less. Next, you want to grab yourself some high quality mustard. We'll be using just enough to thinly coat our tenderloin. So any mustard that you like will do. Next up, you want to punch up the flavor with some aromatics. So you're going to grab what you see right here, and we'll start with a couple of sprigs of fresh thyme, as well as two to three cloves of garlic and about a quarter or half of a red onion. And you can always, of course, switch out that onion for a Spanish or yellow onion, depending what you like. With the aromatics covered, we're going to go ahead and move on to a very important part that you may have heard of before, and that is the duck cell. Now, traditionally, duck cell is simply made from a bunch of button mushrooms that you, well, chop finely, but we're going to kind of mix this up a bit and add our own little nuance, and that's by adding a couple of different kinds of mushrooms. In this case, I'm grabbing some shiitake mushrooms as well as some oyster mushrooms. Now, as you can see here, the shiitakes have a woody stem, and we're just going to go ahead and remove those and keep the cap. By comparison, the oyster mushrooms can be used in their entirety, and I recommend that you cut all these up quite finely and use as much of this as you can because they're a little bit on the expensive side. So there you go, there are the mushrooms we'll be using for our duck cell. Just make sure that you use a variety that you like and make sure you use them in about equal proportions. Let's move these to the side because we have to introduce our final very important ingredient, and that is going to be some bourbon. Now, I realize that bourbon perhaps is not a traditional choice, and that would maybe fall to a cognac or a brandy or something of that nature, but this bourbon is delicious, and it's what I had. Anyways, that covers the ingredients, so let's get to the prep. And to start, you're going to want to season the heck out of your beef tenderloin. I mean, you want to be real generous here, so grab yourself a good helping of your salt, as well as some black pepper. And then you're just going to want to go ahead and turn this on its side and just continue the process until this is thoroughly covered. Now, I stress the seasoning because this really does need a lot of help. Beef tenderloin doesn't have a ton of depth of flavor, and the salt is going to go a long way in both the sear and, of course, in our flavor. And voila, you have yourself a wonderful beef tenderloin that is seasoned and ready to rest for a few minutes while we prep the rest of our ingredients. So go ahead and move this to the side and grab your mushrooms. After you made yourself a nice mess, go ahead and just kind of clean all that up and begin to take these stems off of your shiitake. And don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with this process. We'll just speed it up a bit, but basically just make sure you have no stems kicking around. That doesn't mean, by the way, that you have to throw them out because you could use them for a stock later if you so choose. Anyways, with the shiitake mushrooms cleaned, go ahead and grab your button mushrooms and quarter them with your knife. And you might be wondering why we're not cutting all these mushrooms in a fine dice right away. Well, don't worry, we'll get to that. So continue to quarter up your button mushrooms until you're done and then grab your oyster mushrooms. 
So go ahead and give these a rough chop as well. It doesn't really matter the size because we're going to be throwing these into a food processor. So go ahead and grab a food processor and just lay that gently down on the workstation and load that sucker up. Now I have a fairly small food processor, but if you have a bigger one, you'll be able to put all these mushrooms in at once. And if you don't have a food processor, just go ahead and begin chopping very quickly and very finely. Ultimately, what you're looking for is a fine dice that looks something like this. You can see everything is finely diced, which is exactly what we're looking for. You do not want any chunks, guys. Trust me on that. So go ahead and move your finely diced mushrooms off to the side, because it's time to grab ourselves some fresh thyme. Now I've got quite a lot here, and this really depends on your taste and how much you're making, but we're just gonna go ahead and pick this right off of the stem, which I'm not gonna bore you with, but you can see we're using quite a bit of fresh thyme here. About three or four tablespoons is what we're looking for. Then just give this a quick pass through with your knife to make sure everything is nice and chopped up before adding it back into our bowl of mushrooms. Then you wanna season this with a good pinch of kosher salt, as well as a couple of cranks on your pepper mill. Then gently fold your mushroom mixture together and move this off to the side because it's basically ready for the pan. And in that pan, we're gonna go ahead and throw in some of our red onion, which we're also going to dice finely, along with some garlic, which we're going to smash and then put in our garlic press to save some time. Put your finely diced aromatics on a plate and we're basically ready to get into the pan. And speaking of that pan, we're gonna go ahead and put that on medium high heat with about two or three teaspoons of oil before dropping in our beautiful beef tenderloin. As you can see, we're trying to develop some color on every side, which means we're gonna have to tip this onto its edges as well. Now, that being said, each side should only be cooked for about a minute or two, guys. Don't do more than that. We're just trying to get some color. Once every side of your tenderloin is a beautiful golden brown, go ahead and transfer this onto a sheet or baking rack or whatever you have kicking around because this thing needs to rest until it's basically cooled down completely. So about 10 or 15 minutes. Now, while that's resting, go back to your pan and check out all of the wonderful brown bits that we got. That is tons of flavor, and we're going to pick that all up with our diced aromatics. So go ahead and dump in all of your aromatics, give this a quick stir, and let it cook down for about two or three minutes or until fragrant. Once your kitchen smells amazing and everything is looking translucent, it is time to add in the mushroom mixture. So go ahead and dump all of that in there, and then just spread it out so it covers the surface of the pan. Now at this point guys, what we're trying to do is cook down our mushrooms to release all of that water and essentially form a mushroom paste. I know that doesn't sound appetizing, but that's okay. We're going to add our knob of butter here because butter always makes everything better. And this will help add some flavor as well as increase that pastiness that we're looking for. And what will go amazing with that butter is of course our garlic. So go ahead and add that in. Just let it stir around and cook down a bit before mixing everything together once again. Once the butter is in, let that melt and combine until you have a bit of a paste-like texture and this is now the perfect time to add in your alcohol. Now you're only gonna need about a tablespoon or so of your alcohol, so just dump that in and let that cook off. Should only take about 30 or 40 seconds. You can also uh, light this on fire if you're feeling a little adventurous, but for me, I just wanted to cook down and let it do its thing. And you can see this is now starting to look like a spreadable paste, and that's how you know that you have a duck cell. So with that done, grab yourself a clean bowl and just transfer your duck cell into said bowl to let it cool down. Again, up close, you can see the texture that we have. There's a lot of flavor in this, guys. It's gonna go really well on the outside of our tenderloin. Speaking of our tenderloin, go ahead and grab that along with your mustard because it is finally time to coat this beef. Now, again, depending on the size of your tenderloin, it's gonna take a little bit more or a little bit less mustard, but basically enough to coat every nook and cranny with a thin layer of mustard. With your beef thoroughly coated, you should have something that looks a little bit like this. With that done, we're gonna move this to the side because we have to work on our pastry. And to start, we're gonna grab ourselves a small bowl as well as a single egg to create our egg wash. So go ahead and dump that in and add about a tablespoon of water. Give it a quick mix and well, the easiest part of this recipe is now done. Yum. All right, with that egg wash done, go ahead and move this to the side and grab your puff pastry. 
So as you can see, I've got one whole roll of puff pastry and here's where I made my first mistake. And no, it's not the flowering the surface or the rolling out of the puff pastry itself. It's actually that I rolled it too thin. And as you can imagine, when you're rolling something, having a slightly thicker layer of puff pastry on the outside is going to give you a little bit more ability to keep all those juices in and also just give you a better actual crust. So if it's your first time making beef wellington like me, definitely recommend that you keep your puff pastry a little bit on the thicker side or have extra puff pastry kicking around in case you make any mistakes. But I don't have time to dwell on my mistakes, we have got to move forward. So next up is going to be some plastic wrap, which we're going to get about two or three layers here. And then we're going to lay all of our prosciutto over top. Now you're going to want to try to get your prosciutto off in one piece, unlike what I did, and then lay this perpendicular across the plastic wrap. The prosciutto is going to be a barrier between our duck cell and our tenderloin, as well as our pastry, and the plastic wrap is going to help us roll. So once you've shingled your prosciutto down nicely enough, go ahead and grab your duck cell and smear a thin layer, well, a little bit like peanut butter. Now this can be a bit of a delicate process, so I do recommend that you use a rubber spatula and take your time. You're also going to want to try your best to have as even and thin a coating as possible. And I want to stress thin layer because I think here is where I made my second mistake, which is that I had too much duck cell and that it had a bit too much moisture in it. So try to cook it down a bit more and keep a thinner layer, but definitely you want it to be evenly spread out. Then simply grab your beef tenderloin and go ahead and pop this on the end. Then grab the plastic wrap and gently try to fold this all over. Again, as you can see, I'm no expert here. Just do your best and begin the rolling process. And don't worry about too much of those open flaps at the end. You can just tuck that all in or simply cut it off. Again, the plastic wrap does come in handy here. Next, we want to make sure that we bind all this together by rolling it tightly in our plastic wrap and just giving this a quick twist and twirl. Basically, grab each end and twist in slightly opposite directions and then just go ahead and roll it tightly. You'll then want to put this in your freezer for about 10 or 15 minutes so that it gets nice and chilled. A few moments later. So after about 15 or 20 minutes, it is time to unravel our puff pastry. And don't be afraid to add some more flour here if you find that it's sticking. In any case, do your best to spread this out before laying down your wrapped beef tenderloin. Now, obviously, you're going to want to be fairly gentle here when you first start rolling this. But I do recommend that you do it with some confidence because it's actually going to help prevent more tearing. Now, if you're like me, you're naturally inclined to cut off the excess, and actually, I think this is where we made our third mistake. I think I should have continued to roll this parcel to make a natural seam and then cut it off, as opposed to cutting it off a little bit short. So instead, I tried to make my own seam, and you're going to see the problem with that soon enough. Now, for the ends, you're going to want to go ahead and cut off the excess as well, and then just go ahead and tuck this in. It's not pretty, but it'll work just fine. Remember that problem I was talking about? Well, there it is. As you can see, we just don't have enough coverage there, and that seam is really thin. And I really think that that gap right there is really where all of our problems stem from. I tried to add a strip of pastry like you see here, but really to no avail. It just didn't stick and didn't really fix the problem. But hindsight is 2020, and we're fairly confident at this point, so we're going to go ahead and lay this down, take the back of our knife, and cut a couple of scores into the top of our pastry. Now, you don't have to do this, of course, but I was feeling confident and a little bit fancy, so we went with a crosshatch pattern. Don't worry if you score through it too much, it's not the end of the world. But one thing you don't want to forget is your egg wash, so go ahead and apply that liberally along the outside of your pastry. Once you've gotten into every nook and cranny with that egg wash, go ahead and grab yourself some kosher salt and just sprinkle this fairly liberally on top. This is going to help with the crust and add a little bit more flavor. Finally, we're going to add a couple of sprigs of fresh thyme and just lay it gently on top. And there you go. We are ready for the oven. An oven that is set to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. And this will go in for about 35 to 40 minutes or until golden brown on the outside and medium rare on the inside. So after about 40 minutes, you should have something that looks like this. And you're going to notice very quickly that there is some juices leaking out of here. And that is not a good sign when you make a beef wellington. The other thing you're going to notice is that there is something very important missing. And you probably don't even know what it is. But for those keen observers, you will notice that I have not put down any parchment paper. I didn't put anything to make this non-stick, which means we made a really massive mistake. Because unfortunately, this thing is not going to come off of this pan. So yes, having a thin dough is not good, and maybe having a little bit too much moisture can be avoided as well. But definitely, guys, put down some parchment paper so this thing will actually come off of your cooking surface. Now, sharing this footage hurts my soul, and I hope it hurts yours as well. But hopefully, this will give you some insights into things that you should not be doing. In any case, we've managed to more or less separate our beef wellington from our cooking sheet, and hopefully we'll have redeemed ourselves with a nice cook. 
Now to cut through this, I would recommend a bread knife to start and then you can switch to a normal chef's knife or cut through it entirely. But as you can see here, guys, we actually do have a beautiful medium rare cook on our beef tenderloin. So at least we got that right. But you can also see how the bottom layer is not properly attached. There's too much moisture and the actual dough is too thin. So that combination has led to, well, soggy dough on the bottom, but crispy dough on the top. Now, a potential way to avoid this would be to cook on a wire rack as that would allow for a little bit more air to circulate or if you have a convection oven that would probably help as well anyways this thing is messy but it is done so go ahead and grab yourself a plate drop in your nicest piece of beef wellington and grab yourself some grilled vegetables that you had kicking around for additional flavor and color and there you go guys there is my very first attempt at a beef wellington hopefully this will give you some insights into all the mistakes not to make but we do have a nice cook on it and we also have a nice crispy top of our pastry now, while it's clear that the execution was lacking, let's at least give this a shot and give it a taste. Again, up close and as a single piece, it does look pretty good. You can see we have some nice flakiness from the puff pastry. We got some moisture kicking in from the mushroom and the duck cell, and we've got a nice cook on our meat. And yeah, don't let your eyes deceive you. This is goddamn tasty. There's just a lot of layering of flavor, some beautiful depth from the mushrooms, a nice kind of tanginess from the mustard, and you just get this wonderfully interesting combination with the pastry and the meat. It kind of adds a little bit of sweetness and the beefiness that you get from that beef tenderloin after it's been cooking like that. It's well seasoned. It just, it just really comes together really nicely. Now, with all that being said, guys, I want to give a quick recap of some of the mistakes that I made so that you can avoid them in the future and have a better final product than what you see here. So to start, you're going to want to remove as much moisture as possible. That means cooking down the duck cell properly and making sure that you have a nice even and thin layer of your duck cell when you're starting the actual spreading process on your prosciutto. The second tip is that thicker is better when it comes to your pastry. Don't roll it out too thin. You do want a bit of thickness. It'll kind of protect and seal everything inside. And that's really important when you're making a beef wellington. And finally, and most importantly, nonstick. Get yourself a non-stick surface. Please use parchment paper or anything else, a wire rack, just some combination where this thing won't stick because it completely ruined the bottom of my dish. Now again, all that being said, this is really delicious and I do really hope you give this a shot. Now, for those of you who have made it to the end of this video and want to know how long this will actually take you to make, well, with resting time included, it will take just around two hours. And that's actually me moving pretty quickly and I'd research this a little bit before doing. But again, this was my first attempt. So if you've made this before, I am sure you can do it a lot faster. But for me, I was a bit of a newbie and it took me just under two hours. And finally, guys, for cost, as you can imagine, this is an expensive undertaking. These are premium ingredients, and that's going to command a premium price. How much, you're wondering? Well, even after prepping the tenderloin myself and getting a pretty good deal on it, this is still going to run you about $18 per plate. Uh, yeah, just keep that in mind if you're planning on making this. Uh, hopefully, you don't make the mistakes like I did, and you'll end up with a really awesome and really delicious dinner, either for yourself, your date, or some guests that are visiting. Anyways, folks, I hope this gives you some insights into all of the challenges that come with beef wellington but i hope it doesn't discourage you from actually trying to make this dish that being said guys thank you so much for watching until the end of this video and as always thumbs if you liked it subs if you loved it we will see you in the next one